Today's podcast is sponsored by Gifts the Movie. Gifts, be careful in all that you wish for. Be sure to check out the trailer at Facebook.com slash Gifts Movie. That's Facebook.com slash Gifts Movie. You are now experiencing the digital life with Kevin Lockett. Hey everybody, welcome to The Digital Life. You know, one of my favorite apps is Shazam. Thanks to this handy app, I've been able to find great new music during TV shows, movies, and especially commercials. Two of my favorite songs right now are Steve Aoki's So Freakin' and Flux Pavilion's I Can't Stop. And I found them both by using my Shazam app during commercials, not by listening to traditional radio. Prior to their recent success, the Black Keys from Akron, which is also home of this podcast, licensed their music for years to TV shows and commercials. By doing this, they not only made a living, but exposed their music to millions of TV sets across the world. Today's guest and his band are also part of his music licensing revolution. Maurice Martin is the lead singer of the Akron Cleveland bass band Winslow. In recent years, the band has licensed their music to MTV, NASCAR, and other entities to not only build their brand, but like the Black Keys, allow their music to be heard in millions of homes across the U.S. and abroad. I had a great time talking to Maurice about music licensing, as well as the band's YouTube show, The Winslow Chronicles and a film score he has done for a new Cleveland Browns documentary. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Maurice Martin from the band Winslow. Okay, we're talking to Maurice from the band Winslow. How are you doing today, sir? Oh, I'm great. It's a beautiful morning. I couldn't complain at all. Yeah, right before we started talking, you said you were watching uh, reality TV. Yeah, well, um, I'm, a, I'm kind of a reality TV addict. I, I don't like to admit it to many people, but I don't have a choice now. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, right now, I'm actually watching a celebrity wife swap <laughs> between that and the real world and like uh, all these other shows. Man, I just I get addicted. It's terrible. Yeah, I just I just finished up uh, some therapy. Yeah, couples therapy. Honestly. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was lovely seeing the transformation from uh, Flavor Flay from being a horrible, uh, I guess, would be boyfriend to a loving, doting father. Right, I'm sure that'll last for like two weeks. It'll be great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Once they leave the facility, it's like, oh, I'm back to being Flav again. Right, you know, it's like you know we're we're on this climb, trying trying to make it, and you you kind of start to wonder, like, you know, someday, well, will my life be dysfunctional enough for me to have to be on one of these TV shows? But you know, it's okay. <laughs> I, guess, I guess if you're getting a check, I guess it's not too bad. Right, right. I like checks. I like making money. That's okay. <laughs> Speaking of reality TV, you know, I'm I'm not ashamed to admit I watched the Bad Girls Club, uh, for good or bad, and uh, I had no idea that uh, that Winslow has songs on that show. So if I see someone getting the the heck beaten out of them, your music might be playing. Well, here's the thing though, because we are, yeah we just signed contracts with our the Kardashian series with the Real World. Uh, with the Bad Girls Club, but I have a feeling like the music might really be be used when 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 the bumping and grinding and shaking the sheets is happening. I don't even think you're using Winslow for the fights. I mean, it might happen, but you know, we got that baby making music, so it should be for like the more gentle moments of those shows. <laughs> so, so for those like, baby making uh, dramatic scenes, you'll you'll be probably, probably be playing. Right, right. When we're trying to feel love and happiness, that's when Winslow will come on. I don't really think it's uh, going to be when people are ready to throw down on all that stuff. <laughs> So how does that work exactly? How did how did you guys able to get a music licensing deal? And how, and do they contact you saying we're going to use these certain songs, or do they just have carte blanche to use whatever songs they want? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're working with a company called Tinderbox Music out of Minnesota, and Tinderbox, um, you know, they they did a radio campaign with our album, and we had some real good success. And so they actually went out and, and worked a campaign for us to try to get us on some shows. Um, you know, the, the expectation beforehand was we was hoping maybe we could get two to three contracts with, with some, some shows. And we, we really had an, an amazing track record. Ended up getting 15 contracts with different stations and different TV shows. And so what will happen is, you know, some of these shows, they'll kind of hit us up probably, you know, the week before a show and say, you know, hey, the next episode of The Real World is going to have a part of one of your songs in it. Um, they have the full album that we just released in March. And so all of the shows that we have contracts with, that includes NASCAR, um, they, they, they have the free reign to use any of the 10 songs on the album. Do you say no to something or they can use whatever they want? 
Yeah, I mean, I chose to say no already passed, honestly. So, <laughs> you know, basically, like, you know, if the real world comes up to you and wants a contract, you know, we have the ability to say, you know what, we don't believe in the show or whatever and not sign certain contracts. So the fact that we signed all of them means we were fine with all of the different placement opportunities we had. Um, like one of them is for um, the Discovery Networks. I mean, there's a ton of channels in that. So, I mean, you, we don't really know what our, show, our music's going to end up on. And, you know, some of that might just be the instrumental music, but, you know, we were really cool with all the shows that we're going to play as it was nothing too controversial that we knew about. So, so it's interesting because your band's been around since about 2005, maybe, or is it? What, yeah. What? Mm-hmm. And it seems like, like in the beginning, when you, ever, you start a band, I mean, you're all into the music, you know, you want to be the best musicians possible, and you're still striving for that, but it seems like there was a sea change someplace where you guys became very business-minded. Were you always business-minded, or was there a switch someplace where you started saying, okay, we, maybe we need to start reaching out and doing different things as far as endorsements? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, honestly, we started, I started being business-minded years ago, and I would say, I mean, probably back 2008 when we released our first album. I mean, by then, we were already going after some endorsement deals, and we were already starting to take our business seriously. But the reality was we were a much smaller band back then. You know, we hadn't really accomplished much yet. And so with some of the things that we were able to do, you know, over those next few years, I I think that now when we're making when we're making waves we just can make bigger waves, you know. Before we were getting in, you know, a little magazine in Akron, you know, this album we were getting in Guitar World magazine. You know, so <laughs> it's not that we weren't really taking it serious before, but I I just think it's the natural growth of the band. Yeah, I was on a Twitter conversation with a guy and I said, you know what, some of the best music I've found over the past few years has been either been through T V shows or commercials yeah. it just seems like especially if you if you don't seem to fit whatever they want to play on the radio nowadays that's the best place to go if you have a different sound or a sound that you think should appeal to people but then you're not getting that type of airplay well and and the other huge element in that and a lot of people don't know this but that's where the money is the reality is you know touring is expensive you know to get in a van put five to six guys in it travel to a show, get hotels, and then at the end of the day, you're really getting paid off of, you know, how many people are coming in. And if you're not well-known, you're not making a lot of money. You know, if you can get your music in movies or TV shows or, like you said, commercials, there's money that comes in and it's residual. But that's everybody's dream. I mean, you want to know what's the difference between us now and then? At the end of the day, we want to get to that point where we don't have to go clock in at a day job every day. And we're still there now, but you know, if we can get that music or that money coming in through our music, we can we can make those dreams come true. So I I just think that that's part of the transition process is we learn what we can do to make money. It, it is amazing because most people don't realize uh, who follow your band is that you guys do have day jobs. Yeah. So how how do keep that way? So how do how do you balance that by having day jobs? And you have to pay the bills, but at the same time, you guys are very passionate on stage. What's practice time like for that for you guys? It's tough, man. Yeah, our practice is intense for us. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of bands, they get together two, three times a week for hours at a time. We don't, we can't do that. We really can't. Um, and so, well, basically, we practice every Tuesday night. And on Tuesday nights, you know, it's two to three hours, but it's intense practices. And, you know, we get into, you know, not only the songs and songwriting, but we get into, like, the show itself. And this is how we need to move during the show. And this is, you know, when we just, we just grind as hard as we can for two to three hours every week. And, um, you know, it's just, we, we try to look at it as when it's, when it's band time, it's band time. People put their cell phones away and we just, we just, we just get focused. And, um, you know, shows are, are hard too. I mean, honestly, sometimes the guys from our band are, uh, yeah, I'll give you an example. Three weeks ago, I, I came from my day job. I was wearing my, my uniform for my day job. I pulled into the parking lot, I changed my clothes, and we performed in front of, like, I couldn't tell you how many people were in the crowd. It was probably at least two to 3,000 people. And I mean, we're talking in the car, the crowd's already there, and I'm changing. It's tough sometimes, but, you know, we kind of just keep ourselves, keep each other focused. One of the things I enjoy about uh, you guys is your uh, use of social media, including the um, Winslow Chronicles. Yeah, yeah, and it's almost absolutely. like uh, watching House of Cards, where it's like you watch, you watch it, it's like, oh no, the never episode won't be on for another year. <laughs> 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 but it's interesting. It's interesting just because um, you you get to see how you guys are, how you interact with each other. But the one thing I know is there's a lot of great music in the video, but also a lot of eating. 
yeah, we are a band who loves food. <laughs> like, you have no idea. And the funny thing is we just released our newest, uh, the newest episode, and there was a whole scene of us just eating, and we ended up cutting cutting out one of the, the, the food uh, scenes because it, it was too long. Um, anytime we're together, we got to break bread, sit down, have a meal, and just just have way too much fun. So, yes, we, we are a band who loves food. If, if anybody out there wants to make Winslow some sandwiches, we are open to it. So what was it like being at South by Southwest? Because I was like, it was that's your first time there, right? Yeah, it was it was absolutely incredible. Uh, you know, a quick story about it. Uh, the, the first night we got there, you know, we met with our, our PR company, and, uh, you know, and, and had a, took care of business. Day two was our first show. And so if you watch the Chronicles, you see everything leading up to the first show, but you don't see the footage. Mm-hmm. Well, the reason is, you know, we went into this venue we were playing at on the first day. And there was like three people inside of the venue, and the band didn't even sit on the stage. Mm. So, I mean, if you can imagine that, you're going, we just drove 24 hours. We don't sit on the stage, and there's three people in the room. This was a waste of a drive, and we were all kind of demoralized. And so, long story short, the set starts, and we just were like, hey, we're here. Let's just throw down. And as we start playing, people just start filtering into this room we're playing in. And it's like, oh, there's 10 people, then there's 20, then there's 30, and people are in there and they're dancing. And we were like, whoa. I mean, that's I, that, that's the kind of the kind of moment you have where, you know, we weren't in front of 10,000 people or 5,000 people, but it didn't matter. And uh, that, that's, I, that's really the show. I wish we would have been able to catch it with that Chronicles episode. But it, it's South by Southwest. It was an incredible experience for us. We met a lot of amazing people down there and just you know, got a chance to spread the music, and that's what it's all about. What's the biggest thing that you gain from from interacting with different people in the bands down there? Well, you know, just different people's stories. You know, you're trying to find out what are you guys doing, you know? How are you touring the way you are? Or, you know, you try to gauge yourself. Are we where we need to be? Or do we have a bunch of stuff we got to take care of and fix? And so that's, that's, really, that's really it, just kind of using it as a measuring tool. And that's really what we did. Now, your band, for most people who don't know, you, you, you're a great band just because you combine rock and soul. Yeah. And the other day I was in a record exchange or the exchange, whatever they call it nowadays, and I picked up Princess 1999 for a dollar, which is blasphemy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's blasphemy. But hey, it's a good buy. Right. But, <laughs> um, but it, it still amazes me that back then, 30 years ago, you could combine rock and R&B, and it, it no problem. It would be played on a radio, pop and R&B stations. And even 20 years ago, with bands like Mick Edison and Tony Tony Tony, and even in recent years like Bruno Mars and Maroon 5, early Maroon 5, but yeah, you know. But the one thing, being a, a still relatively new band, even though you've been around for a while, you're still fighting being put in a box. How how frustrating is that? Because you know the paradigm of rock and soul can work. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a confusing world. I would be totally honest with you. Um, you know, when you're an artist, when you're a musician, everybody says to you, learn how to make music that is truly unique. You know, learn how to make music that nobody out there is doing. Isn't that, I mean, I think that's the message we get. But the reality is, if you really make music that is, you know, unique in its presentation, that, that combines things, maybe in a way that nobody else is combining them, it, it's it's a blessing and a curse. Um, you know, when you were talking about our corporate sponsorships and stuff, in some ways, the music we make is really, really desirable to corporate America. You know, they see the vision and they understand it, and that's great. But sometimes to the average music listener, they really just want to hear something that they've heard before. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, all those groups, from anything from, you know, songs about Jane by Maroon 5 to Prince to Michael Jackson. There's definitely been soul and rock and soul and R&B and rock together. But because we don't sound just like Prince or just like MJ or just like Maroon 5, I think that sometimes the consumer, you know, the actual people listening to the albums are hesitant about what the heck is this? I don't know what to call it. Maybe I shouldn't buy it. Uh, so, you know, there's, it's tough. It, it makes things really hard for us. And, and we just, we try to just stay true to who we are. We're not going to, we're not going to force, you know, certain music genres or write an album that sounds like something because somebody wants us to. We write the music we believe in. We write the music we feel. And we just hope that over time, people will feel it with us. When did you know you wanted to be a uh, performer? 
I was a little kid. I was a little kid. If you go ask my elementary school teachers why I never shut up and always had to crack jokes. <laughs> yeah, when I when I was when I was tiny. Um, you know, I it, I didn't know if it was gonna be more more in the acting world or more in the music world, but you know, by the time I reached high school or even junior high, music just has always resonated with me. You know, sometimes sometimes you just feel lonely and you feel or you feel incomplete. And, you know, and as men, we don't ever talk about that stuff, but it's real. And, you know, I never feel that kind of way when I'm on a stage. When I'm on a stage, I just feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be. So, I, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a love affair. i got a love-hate relationship with music. <laughs> yeah. So what would you say to a young band who, who um, they're, well, they've been practicing, they've been doodling around a bit, and they want to make an album, but they don't have a lot of money? So if you don't have a lot of money, but you want to put out your music, what is the suggestions do you have for them? Well, you know, there's a couple of things. You know, first of all, figure out what you want to do before you go to the studio. A lot of bands, they're like, well, we'll go to the studio and then we'll figure out how we want to play the song. That is the exact opposite of what you should do if you're a band on a budget. So, you know, to give you kind of an example of what Winslow did, we sat down and we actually dissected and changed all of our songs before we went to the studio. So, you know, we even, you could even check out an iPhone. We took out our phones, and we recorded ourselves playing a song, and then we said, okay, if we wanted to try to get this song to be better, what changes will we make? We wrote the changes down, and we started practicing. We practiced to a metronome, so the, the drummer had a click track in his ears. So by the time we hit the studio, we, we already knew exactly what parts we were going to play in each part of every song. Therefore, like, you're, you're, you're going to go faster. Um, you're, you're not going to be wasting a lot of time, so it's going to keep your cost low. You know, we were never staring at the clock in the studio because we were so well rehearsed that it, we didn't have a reason to be worried or nervous. So that's the start. You know, figure out the music you want to play on your album. Fine-tune it before you touch the studio. And then the biggest thing is, you know, find the studio that's right for you. If the first place you go to doesn't seem right, don't just force yourself to go there. There are... There are dozens of studios in every major city. Go find the right studio for you. Somebody's going to take care of you on price because studios are hurting right now. They need bands in. So, you know, just be patient. It's, it's got to be a patient process. Don't be in a rush. And uh, how important has social media been for the band as far as getting your word out? It's been huge. It's been huge. Word of mouth is everything in the entertainment world. Um, you know, we're we're not, I wouldn't say we're as good as some bands. I mean, you see some bands, they post something and, you know, within an hour they got, you know, 100 new followers and, <laughs> you know, they just they just kill. Um, but I would say at the same time, you know, social media, like we go to shows every single show and somebody's in the crowd saying, I saw you guys on Facebook, I watched your video on YouTube, I found you guys on Twitter and saw you were doing something. So, you know, social media is huge. Social media is huge. Do you guys operate your own social media, or do you have someone that kind of helps out with you, with the few feet, with you on that? Yeah, that's me. So anytime you see anything that's posted, that's always me. <laughs> so you handle everything. You book the act, you, you book the van, you, <laughs> you, except for driving this van. I know you don't drive the van. Yeah, I don't drive the van. I get to sit in the passenger seat and video type. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, everything. Um, you know, it's not that I do, you know, the, 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 all the guys in the band really do have a role, um, but, you know, we... I, I book the shows, um, you know, I do this a lot of social media stuff. I, I design our website. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I wear a lot of hats in the band, but it's just because I can't. And, uh, you know, okay, one of the guys in the band, his job, when we have to run our own sound, he's the sound man. And, and, and he owns that. There's one guy who's in charge of payroll and all the money situations. You know, there's somebody else who primarily focuses on the songwriting aspects. So, you know, he comes up with new riffs and new ideas that we can then write on top of. So, you know, I, my role is to manage the band, and, and the other guys, they have roles too. It's just mine, all my roles really have to do with our interaction with the public. Yeah, you guys seem like you're like a corporation with rhythm. I mean, it seems like, you know, you're, you're very <laughs> focused. Yeah, you're, you're like, okay, you play bass, but you can also do this. You play drums, but you also do this. It's like you fit the musical talent, but also not musical talent the person has. You also fit that within the band as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, to any young band who wants to know how you get to the point where at, this is it. It really is. You know, if you want to get farther than just playing the local the local show down the street, you know, the real key is you have to understand that there's a lot of roles that have to be played in the band. 
you got to get shows. But once you get shows, you have to get the word out about all the shows. You have to have set lists for the shows. When you get to the show, you have to have merchandise. You have to have somebody who can sell the merchandise. You have to, to keep all the merchandise and track it all. And, you know, there's just all this stuff. And so either you have to find somebody who's willing to come in and be a manager and manage you and do a lot of that stuff for you, or you got to work together as a team and you got to put those pieces together. Almost every band that I know who's on this level, who's you know in between the local stage and, and the national stage where you're still regional, almost all those bands do it on their own, and they just work together as a big family, as a big team. And I like the fact how you guys uh, work with a lot of local companies in, in Akron and Cleveland. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we are proud of our city. We're proud of, to be Akronites, and we're proud to be from Cleveland. I mean, because at the end of the day, Cleveland Akron is really the same. It's the same thing, even though people don't want to acknowledge it. So, right. you know, we're... Um, one of the big projects we're working on right now is that we're a part of the, the movie that's coming out uh, called Red Right 88, which is a Cleveland sports movie. I mean, <laughs> we were, like, thrilled to be asked to be a part of that because, like, we feel like we embody what it is to be from Cleveland. Like, we felt the pains of being from Cleveland and the excitement and the joy and all that stuff. And so, um, you know, there's there's some beautiful companies out there, you know, with that from Akron and from Cleveland that, Make from making clothes to making instruments to doing everything, and so why not rep our city? Why not say, hey, you know what? I don't need to go to New York to get this. I'm going to go to Akron to get it because this is where we're from, and that's really that's really our foundation and what we believe. For Red Ride '88, are you just adding music to it, or are you adding music and scoring it? Oh, great question. Um, so basically, we're we're doing music for it. So uh, right now, we're actually working on the title track of the movie, and so. Um, our last practice, actually, it was just hours of, of running a tune that, we're, that we're, we're about to try to get approved for that movie. Um, but I personally am also the assistant music supervisor for the movie, so I'm going to be helping put together the actual acts that will be a part of of uh, the movie, picking the songs, you know, picking the right moments for the right parts of the script and everything. So, you know, we're, we're playing a pretty big role in this film, actually. Yeah, it kind of go back to what we were talking about before. As far as uh, as far as a musician, you can get your music anywhere. It doesn't. You don't have to be on MTV or be the hottest video on YouTube. If you're a musician and you know your craft, your music can be anywhere, anytime. Absolutely. I, you know, again, you know, I I keep taking it back to young musicians and things that people should be looking for and trying to accomplish. You have to think outside of the box. You know, the world of the only way that you can make it big is to have music on the radio. That's not really reality anymore. You know, it's, you know, our band, we get played some on the radio, and, we, and we've and we got some love from some stations across the country, and I'm not saying we haven't, but our real bread and butter has nothing to do with the radio. And so, you know, if you can find your place and find, you know, where you fit in, that's 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 the key. That's the key to success. All right, so let's wrap up doing a rapid-fire question. Sure. First question, the name Winslow. Was the band named after Keller Winslow Jr., Eddie Winslow from Family Matters, Michael Winslow from the Police Academy movies, or none of the above? One of them that I will not reveal. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't expect that one, but that's cool. <laughs> it's, it's one of them. My answer should have just been yes. <laughs> it could have been, but, you know, I like your answer. That's fine. So what has been uh, Winslow's most memorable performance? Uh, opening for Robert Randolph at the House of Blues back in 2010. Wow, what was that like? Unbelievable. Uh, if you've ever seen Robert Randolph, that band absolutely throws down. They were friendly. They were cool as heck. And I don't know, it was just one of those magic shows you never forget. All right. Um, have you met Zoe Saldana yet? I have not met Zoe. I'm still working on it. If you meet her before I do, let her know I'm looking and I'm ready. Yes, if I meet her before you do, you might not get to her. Oh, oh, see, that's rude. That's really rude. <laughs> no, it's, no, no. I love you, man. <laughs> no, it's acting love. I will pass her along to you if I ever come across her. So I appreciate it. At least you're wearing a windblow shirt when you meet her, you know, something. <laughs> right. <laughs> what is your favorite all-time concert, or who is your favorite all-time performer? Ooh, that's rough. Um, the favorite all-time concert I've watched was Earth, Wind, and Fire. Um, my favorite all-time performer has to be Michael Jackson. Well, unfortunately, I never got to see you live. Okay, and uh, let's describe your bandmates in one word, and I'll just name off the names. Sure. Carly. 
game changer. The word would be game changer. Charlie completely changed the face of the band when he ended it. He's, his musicality, his ability to write music. I mean, Charlie is, is the most unbelievable musician we've had in the band. And, uh, you know, if you if you dig our new album, you got to give a whole lot of credit to Charlie because he, he his innovation really made a difference in where our album went to. Curtis, no longer with us. Uh, Curtis actually left the band. Um, Curtis was was one of the original members, and he, he decided he wanted to go back to school and start pursuing some non-music things. So, um, you know, Curtis, I would say for a long time, the backbone of the band, we miss him, we love him to death. There was no big fights or anything like that, but the answer is no longer with us. Oh, so who replaced Curtis? Uh, we don't have a replacement right now, so... Um, you know, we're holding some auditions, but at the same time, you know, we're cool with playing as a five piece and you know, if 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 we find the right person, great, and if not, we're just gonna keep rolling without it. Okay. Uh Matt. Uh, smooth. You listen to Winslow, there's this element of sexiness and sensuality that comes from his saxophone. Smooth, man. He he, he brings the smooth part of our sound. Jesse. Oh, so the heartbeat of the band, man. Jesse plays with this passion. If you if you get a chance to go see a Winslow show, you see that he holds back. I mean, the things that that, that man can play are un, are unreal. But he keeps it in the pocket till he's ready. He plays these just amazing fills. Just I don't know. He just brings life to the music, man. So he's the heart and soul. Danny. Oh, firecracker, I man. Danny is just young, energetic, passionate. Uh, you know, we're, we're we're all sitting there bored when we first get to practice, and Danny walks in, and everybody's laughing the moment he's there. Just um, there, there is this energy that Danny brings, whether it's on the stage or in a rehearsal or in a writing session, that is is really really cool. And you know, he keeps us all going, and, and that's that's something we appreciate. He's like the firecracker. And finally, Maurice, leader. Um, yeah, it's like you said, I do a little bit of everything. So, you know, I do a lot of the writing with the band. Um, I do all the business stuff in the background. And I think I'm a motivator. Um, you know, we, we go through periods as a band, just like you do with anything in life. Sometimes we feel like we're on top of the world. And other times we, um, we're kind of feeling lost and, you know, what's next and what do we have to do with the next thing? And I think I keep people moving in the right direction. And so, you know, I just try to be a leader, just try to be a leader. And one more name, which is, isn't a person, but it is very influential with you guys. Your label, Little Fish. Oh, I mean, Little Fish, I already used the word game changer for Charlie, right? So, I mean, the biggest thing I would say for Little Fish is, you know, they got our back. Uh, you know, Larry from the label is really invested in us from an emotional standpoint. And they're out there trying to talk to, you know, labels in different countries and, you know, different music venues. Just, you know, they, they're trying to see how we can open more doors. And I think that if we get to some of the places we're trying to get, we're going to have to look to the day we find with Little Fish as something that really jump-started that for us because they're, they're, they're helping open some doors, and I think it's just going to keep happening. And the thing about Little Fish is you, you've gotten all these opportunities, and Little Fish is based in Cleveland. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, some people laughed about it. You know, they're saying, well, are you guys going to get signed again? Yeah, we're, we're in contracts, negotiations. Well, who is? Little Fish Records out of Cleveland. Hold on, you're not talking to a major label? No, we're not. But here's the reality. You know, they took care of getting us an album. They got a Grammy nominated engineer to mix part of our album. They got, you know, our stuff mastered by one of the best, uh, you know, mastering houses in the country. They paid for the PR company that got us into Guitar World magazine, Modern Drummer magazine. Space Musicians Magazine. I mean, these doors that we're seeing open, even the stuff we talked about with Tinderbox and getting into, you know, MTV and VH1 and Discovery Networks and NASCAR and E, that's all stuff that, that Little Fish, if they're not there, we don't accomplish those things because we couldn't pay for it on our own. So, yeah, I mean, they're out of Cleveland, but they're making a difference for us. Well, Maurice, thanks for the conversation. If people want to check out Winslow, where can they go? Uh, you can find us all over the web, winslowsoul.com. Uh, if you find me on Instagram, you can find me uh, at Winslow Soul. Twitter, at Winslow Soul. Basically, anywhere you think of at Winslow Soul, you'll probably be able to find us. All right. Well, Maurice, thank you very much, and good luck to everything that you guys do. Oh, thank you so much. We just, you know, we appreciate you having us on and you know, giving us a chance to have a voice. So thank you so much.
I'd like to thank Maurice from the band Winslow for being a great guest on The Digital Life. You can follow the band at winslowsoul.com and be sure to follow them on Twitter, YouTube, and MySpace using Winslow Soul. And also be sure to check out their albums on Amazon and iTunes. Also go to soundcloud.com slash Kevin Lockett where you can hear an extra bonus clip from my talk with Maurice. So check that out, all right? As always, go to digitalkev.com for past shows. Before I go, I have a Twitter question for you. Tweet me at Kevin Lockett and tell me where do you find new music? Is it the radio, YouTube, Pandora, Spotify? Tweet me at Kevin Lockett using the hashtag my music. That's the hashtag my music. And tell me where do you find your music? All right, everybody. It's the Digital Life. I'm Kevin Lockett. And I'm out. The Digital Life with Kevin Lockett. 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 Lockett.